Hello, my name is Molly Mowry, and I'm the Executive Director of the Community Wildfire Planning Center. Thanks so much for the opportunity to participate remotely in this really important workshop. So a lot of our work at CWPC focuses on helping communities and other practitioners to make more informed planning decisions that can affect positive change in the WUI. And this is typically done through for us by uh, providing technical assistance on the adoption of plans and codes and conducting research and recommending solutions to reduce risk in the built environment. So you can see where we fit in on this fire adapted communities graphic related to plans, codes and ordinances. And today I want to briefly highlight some ways in which we recommend wildfire risk reduction through land use planning and then talk more broadly about potential gaps and opportunities in Colorado. So one way we recommend communities address the WUI is through tying applications for new development to a hazard assessment. And this could be either a map or a site specific uh, assessment or both. And this really helps identify the level of hazard and the type of mitigation that would be appropriate, such as locating a, a subdivision away from uh, topographical features or tracts of hazardous vegetation that might contribute to more extreme fire behavior. Subdivision regulations and other development can also, I, I should say should also, require adequate access and water supply. And this is really critical, as I'm sure many of you are already aware, so that both first responders have the ability to safely respond to a fire, and also so that the public or residents have the ability to evacuate safely from an area. You know, too often in the communities that I've worked in, we don't see this adequate access and water supply, and I would consider this a really basic wooey strategy that should be required. We also find ourselves talking more frequently about the adjacent land uses, such as open spaces that could be managed in a way to help reduce wildfire threat to those neighboring uh, residents. And this may sound obvious, but the key point here is to make this really this vegetation management intentional. Um, in other words, you know, open spaces or green spaces by default don't reduce wildfire risk. And so lately there's been some discussion on you know, lose, using land use, um, land uses such as open space as buffers, which is fantastic. But it's really important here that planning departments you know, work with land managers, open space departments and fire departments to make sure that this type of hazard abatement program really works for the purposes that it's intended to. And then wildland areas and trail systems and open space also become important within a community. So this is an example from the Waldo Canyon fire, which some of you may recognize. Um, this, when we did a post-fire study, we found that the, care, the fire carried through the neighborhood where vegetation was unmanaged and the wind pushed through the fire through some of these ravines. And some of those homes that were close to the edge without any setback were more susceptible to direct flame contact, as opposed to some of the homes that were further set back from the slope with defensible space. So there were other factors here such as um, some response and irrigation in some cases. But we do see in many cases that these increased setbacks from a slope with managed vegetation and landscaping really does make a difference for home survival during a wildfire event. So those setbacks become important on the front end of the planning process. And then the maintenance of the fuels is critical once the development is in place. So moving further down to the structure ignition zone concepts, we also see communities effectively managing the WUI through landscaping requirements um, or design guidelines, such as requiring fuel modification plans or identifying which type of plant species should or shouldn't be allowed within certain distances of the home. Um, I'll note here, it's interesting that the state of California recently passed legislation that will require all homeowners in certain areas with, across the state to address the first five feet next to their structure, so that ember resistant zone. Uh, and so I think it'll be really interesting to see how that legislation rolls out in the coming years. Also in the general sphere of the built environment and planning is using ignition resistant or non-combustible building materials and construction methods. 
not just for homes, but for other structure attachments like decks and fences, which of course are also highly combustible under the right conditions. So we can, we can also ask whether some land uses themselves are appropriate in certain places. We spend a lot of time talking about structures, but there's also infrastructure and other types of land use plan, or excuse me, land uses that could be considered hazardous or vulnerable. Um, so in these cases, what we can do through the planning process is look at certain types of conditions that might be appropriate when uh, determining if these land uses can be put in specific areas. So for example, if it's a vulnerable land use like hospitals or care facilities or even prisons, there may be a requirement to have special evacuation considerations. There are many other opportunities that we could talk about today, but um, just one final concept I wanna highlight here is on density. There's different data available on where we're seeing the most structure losses. Sometimes it's um, conflicting a little bit in terms of where we have the highest number of structures lost in the WUI. So it can be tempting to think that high density areas always result in more structure loss, but um, other data suggests that there are more lower density areas in this wooey intermix that are experiencing wildfire due to their rural character. So my advice too is sometimes to take a step back and think about all of this in a larger perspective in terms of what kind of communities we're planning, not just for wildfire, but for other types of climate adaptation strategies. So when we aren't just wearing our wildfire planning hats, you know, what, what other filters do we need to think about for the long term, you know, looking at less car dependent communities or more resilient infrastructure, et cetera. So, you know, I encourage everyone to consider wildfire planning in this larger context about where we want to go in the future with our built environment. So there are a number of different planning tools that I use, I'm sure many of you use when you um, are thinking about or talking about advancing WUI planning. Some of these are implemented more commonly through a fire department or a fire district or a building code uh, division. And then others are more directly under the purview of a planning, uh, excuse me, a community planning department. So most often we see communities really use a combination of these tools. And some of those are based on model codes and then they can be adopted locally um, and amended locally. So we recently conducted an analysis that looked at how four different states, including Colorado, approach land use planning in the WUI from both a state and a local perspective. And perhaps somewhat unsurprisingly, we found several gaps and also some opportunities. So for example, the current Colorado state statutes require that counties and municipalities adopt a master plan. And this master plan is, it's really an advisory document, but it can be binding in the sense that it can be adopted as part of a subdivision or zoning or some other type of land development regulation. So what's interesting in Colorado is that municipalities are required to address natural hazards, including wildfire, in their master plans, but this is actually optional for counties. So we dug into this a little bit and just found that Indeed, there are many counties that have a wildfire risk based on the Colorado Forest Atlas, but they either don't mention wildfire at all in their policies or they do so to a very limited degree. So we found this to be something that is really critical and it's a pretty big significant gap. Um, in addition, many of these master plans are old. And so there's an opportunity to both update them and when they get updated, really include wildfire policies um, into the, the, the overall approach to the master plan. So those, uh, that's one type of legislative barrier. There's other additional challenges we see, some of which include somewhat of a reactionary approach to wildfire planning. So communities often wait for the fire before they're willing to pass any local re uh, regulations. And you know, in, in our experience, this makes it very difficult when rebuilding pressures are very high um, and there's you know, the imperative to hurry up and get back to normal. So we also see that planners are often missing from these broader development um, discussions on statewide or local programs that target the WUI. So as a planner myself, I really am an advocate for you know, needing to both train more planners on wildfire and engage them in these important conversations. 
That leads us directly into solutions, which I know you'll be talking about more at today's workshop. Um, the first one I've already mentioned is how to beef up the county master plans to include wildfire policies. I think there's a few other exciting strategies that we talk more about in the report, and I hope that these get mentioned today. Um, one is to really look at the type of technical assistance that can be provided to not just planners, but to others who engage in WUI planning that want to learn more about land use tools. This might be through understanding what model codes could do at a local level and how they could be adopted to work for uh, local communities or other resources that you know, really could help advance and increase capacity at the local level. Um, we also support programs to address existing development. And by this, I mean a lot looking at a lot of success at those parcel level programs that target the home ignition zone. Uh, we know that a lot of land use targets new development. And so it's an important part of the puzzle is to look at existing development. And then finally, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, to potentially transfer some lessons from other hazards or look at some of the incentives such as community rating programs for floods. You know, are there other models that we could be looking at for wildfire that really could help benefit our work? So there are a lot more resources available on this topic, um, including if you go to the conference mobile app, you can find links to some of these materials from our website. And I really want to thank all of you for the opportunity to present some of these concepts today. Uh, please feel free to be in touch and hope to connect with all of you again soon. Thanks so much.